No, I'm kidding. Um, are we on? Are we on? Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are we're starting a whole new study session, so we're going to do this uh, whole charade over again. So welcome, everybody, to our afternoon study session. It is Friday, March 10th, 2023. It is 12.48 p.m., and we're meeting at 1591 North Jordan Avenue in Provo, Utah. And we will begin with a roll call. I'm Rebecca Nielsen, board president. Jennifer Partridge, vice president. Lisa Boyce, board member. Melanie Hall, board president. Oh, about said it. Oh. Board member. <laughs> do you want to be it? No. <laughs> that is all you. <laughs> Meg Van Wagenen, board member. Terry McKay, board member. Gina Hales, board member. Keith Rattel, superintendent. Derek Anderson, business administrator. Thank you so much. And of course, a welcome to those watching online and everyone who is brave enough to sit here with us all day. Thank you for being here. Um, and we, I will entertain a motion to convene. I move we convene study session. Thank you. Motion made by Board Member Partridge. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Second by Board Member Van Wagenen. And we're now in our study session. And we will start with item number four on the agenda, which is the 23-24 preliminary budget outline. And we'll give our time now to Derek Anderson, our business administrator. Okay, so let's see. Uh, what we're going to go over today is just kind of a, uh, go over the budget, uh, you know, we'll give, give a history of what, where, where we're at as a district, along with kind of give you an overview of how school finance works, you know, um, so uh, that way you have a better understanding of, of, of education finance. Legislative update, um, and what, what's kind of gone on with the legislative session this year, and then move into kind of work priorities also, or not work priorities, sorry, budget priorities. Go your coat, hide your microphone. <laughs> hide the, go, go over the budget priorities um, uh, at the end. So first part of this is kind of a, a guiding principles of accounting, budgeting, and finance. Okay, and this is um, what our district's principles have been. Um, uh, the, the first one is the goals for student achievement should be priority for the budget process. Priority for funding will be given to programs and providers with a proven track record and success in achieving the desired learning outcomes for students. The budget process aims to prioritize resources Allocation for maximum benefits to the children we serve, covering instruction, safety, and security. The budget process permits a review of past spending, discontinuing ineffective or cost inefficient programs. The district budget promotes equal opportunity for every student by providing equitable funding and extra support for struggling students. The district will budget with a long-term perspective, consistently apply proven strategies and improve student performance goals. And the district will ensure transparency in budgeting by revealing true student serving costs, spending limitations, and funding details. Now, when you have guiding principles like that, it can lead to some difficult conversations, <laughs> right? But that's the part of budgeting and finance. It's just the way it works, okay? But that is our guiding principles, okay? So for today, the topic of discussion is going to be, we're going to give a legislative update, we're going to give a budget timeline, we're going to talk about the funds, and we're going to go into how our revenue works, we're going to get into the expenditures and how they work, we're going to uh, um, get into the state of the district, and then the go into budget assumptions. I, uh, the projects piece, I apologize that that was a add-on that uh, didn't have that got didn't get removed from that slide. So the uh, legislative update right now, where we're at, is we got a, a six percent WPU increase. So that brings a new value to four thousand two hundred and eighty dollars. That's an, so we're using the House numbers and not the Senate numbers. Correct. So the House Education Appropriations Bill that was finalized. So that totals $3,137,488 in new funding if we have the exact same number of students. Okay? So that's what that equates to. Does, does that include the $4,200 plus the $1,800? That is just the 6% WP okay. increase. Yeah. So the 
the uh, full day kindergarten was fully funded by the legislature. Equity funding um, had some changes to it. Uh, leftover funds will no longer carry over to the next year. The way it worked was at the end of the year, if there were any equity funding left over, then it would roll over into the next year. What they're going to do now is just pay it out at the end of the year so they are not trying to have this rolling over effect where there, there are numbers that are changing and things like that. They're just going to pay it out at the end of the year and then start fresh back to the next year. But the other piece that this brought was the equalization will now get a half a percent increase when the WPU value increases faster than inflation. Okay, So what that means is, let's say inflation was at 4%. If the WPU increase was at 5%, they would add in an extra half a percent to the, the equity funding piece. Okay, So that's the way that works. Now, in a years of really fast inflation right now, the, the odds of us beating that probably in the next you know, year or two might be not as high, but that is now in law or in code, okay? So HB 215, that, that one passed. That one is the $4,200 that uh, goes directly to teachers, so it's another line item. Um, the, uh, that's, that's actually to an 8.7% increase for our teachers just with that piece, okay? Hello. Oh, thank you. I've locked it. That, that equates to an eight thousand dollar per student um, amount that they, you know, students can take to go to private schools or a charter, you know, a home school or other other opportunities that has uh, come up. So, um, private schools can now participate in public education activities. So we will be able to, if, if a, a private stu student comes to, to say Tip View or Provo High and they want to participate in football or, or band, or they, they have to be given that opportunity, okay? Um, the educate- can, can I ask a, maybe a dumb question? <clears throat> Forge 200 plus benefits, what benefits, because we already give them benefits, right? So what benefits are we talking about? So here's the way the allocation was given, is it's, they, the state is giving $6,000 per teacher, okay, with the intention of $4,200 being on top of their salary, and the remaining piece, the $1,800, is for us to cover the retirement, you know, set the salary, the, the retirement, and the taxes, and, and, and those, the benefits pieces that go with that. To cover the, for, the retirement and taxes for the $4,200. Bingo. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Derek, really quickly on that, so what we do as a district, we'll have to, re, we let them know, like, how do we let them know how many teachers, I think like speech language pathologists are included in this? Every licensed educator yeah. that gets this. Right? Right. So that's we, like, that's how that we're way. funded, every licensed educator. Right? <laughs> educator salary adjustment. So an unsatisfactory review means an employee will no longer be eligible for the COLA of the WPU increase. Okay. What that means is, is let's say next year uh, uh, somebody receives an unsatisfactory review and we gave out a 5% raise but the WPU was 4%. We technically are only supposed to give that employee 1%. Okay? They're saying you cannot give that 4% to them. That's going to create some significant issues for our payroll. right? And that's just a huge difference and change in the way school district salary schedules are structured. So that's just something that we're going to have to get some further guidance on for and work through. Who does the review? That's the, the um, essentially the, their, their supervisor. Okay. Do you think this is a good change or no? Um, it's tough to say. I, I, I don't, I think these wholesale change, wholesale swaths like this, are, are, are that are very prescriptive like that are not very effective um, just because and it leaves us trying to scramble operationally right they it's going to create unintended consequences um, Derek can I ask one more question vouchers the 8,000 I know that's obviously more than double P, WPU so does the WPU if a student that uses that voucher we lose that WPU portion and then the 42 million that's in that in the bill is what covers the other half, basically. Correct. Is that correct? Okay, so, okay, thank you. 
Yeah, so that's what will happen is if, if a student leaves here and goes to a school that would be eligible for that voucher, mm -hmm. we would lose out that 40, well, not the 4,200, we, well, it's the 40, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the WPU value, and, and then the other school would receive that $8,000. So. You may have already answered this and I just forgot about it, but going back to the private schools can now participate in public education activities. Do we charge for those activities, just the basic fee, flat fee that we would pay, change? That's that correct. So we, they'd still be charged the fee for any extracurricular activity that happened. Okay. And my understanding is we already allow this in our district, right? We have a policy that allows home, home and private school students to participate, or is it just home school? I, I don't believe we're homeschool. telling people no. Charter, oh, school is charter schools have always had the opportunity, right? That's been in place. It's now expanding it to private schools. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is the there was a, a change, a big one change to effective teachers in Sorry, high poverty schools. Can I ask one more question about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm thinking about extracurricular. Do they have to live within the district of that school if they're going to participate? Does that make sense? Like if you're if yeah. if you're a private school going to American Fork, but you live in Timfew Boundaries, can you? They can choose. Can they, can they choose to whatever school they want to to participate in extracurricular? So I, I'm not fully on that. I don't think they can live down in like Nebo's Boundaries, but drive up here to play football. I think they yeah. have to live inside the educational they can, boundaries. They can choice just like any other public school student could, but then they're under the same rules that if they wanted to switch the next year to a different school, they wouldn't be able to participate in the sport for a year and all those kinds of things. So, yeah. every private school so they're under the same rule. On that. Derek and I were both somewhat vocal with legislators about that this was going to potentially increase recruiting, yeah. and yeah. it wasn't really heard. It, it definitely will increase the number of recruiting that happens, or you, you could easily have a, a charter or a private school pop up, you know, right in the middle of town that recruits from, you know, Zimbabwe, bring players here, and then give them to Provo or attempt you to play football or basketball or whatever. Uh, that wasn't in HB 15. It was in HB 209. Yeah, there's two numbers. So the, the effective teachers of high poverty schools, um, that's already existing law, but there's some, uh, there's some changes to it. There's minor tweaks to the metrics, meaning the levels of thresholds. The big change here is that charters are not, no longer eligible to receive this funding. Okay? And what that is is, is if you're an educator, a teacher, in a classroom with high poverty students, you know, 70% are intergenerational poverty, then they would get an additional stipend uh, of being essentially in that classroom. This is a hard one to get. It's a classroom, essentially by classroom designation. I don't know how many we've got. Bingo. So there you go. Yeah. They, they have to, they, the students have to, like, there has to be 70% pass rate in the class or something like that. Right. Performance. Yeah, okay. The teachers have to work part of that. They, they, you well, think about that poverty class rate. Well, we have the high, highly impacted kids, which is great, but yeah. those are the kids that are struggling. So you ask for 70% in a regular classroom, that's an ask. Yeah. But you ask for it in a highly impacted classroom. Yeah. Yeah. In, in this bill, it's 70. And it's not growth, it's just, yep. sorry. It's not measuring growth, correct? The new bill is 70. It, the, the new bill is 70%, that's, that's the new metric. It's not growth. So anyway, there was a, um, a, a change to some of the metrics, okay? So th those are kind of the big, big ones that had big, big changes. There were, were our six pages of bills. Um, I've shared with you a Google Doc or Google Drive uh, that has a, a document of all those bills that were passed, okay? And that was just a summary of bills that were passed. So if you want to go through and further go into the, just the smaller ones, there, there's a, a, a link to that.
Okay, so the budget timeline, what you've got is, this is our budget timeline, and in Google Drive, this Gantt chart is also in there um, for this budget timeline. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of an accelerated year um, uh, for our budget. We were gonna be having the budget finally, have the final approval at the end of May. And so that means we're gonna be having to accelerate a little bit on our budget process, okay? But we will be essentially keeping track of that um, and updating that. There's a couple of dates to keep in mind up in there. <clears throat> There's a couple of dates to <laughs> keep in mind in there. <laughs> um, they are the, uh, the, the adoption, the hearing, and the presentation, okay? Um, those are gonna be the, the kind of the big key dates that we're pushing towards. And you can see that it's the end of April, uh, the, second, the first meeting in May, and then the, the second meeting in May will be the one that we adopt. So the funds, okay, what are funds? So a fund is a grouping of how you um, determine operations, okay? So your fund 10 is your general fund. It's your general operations fund. That's gonna be where we operate. You know, our teachers are in there. All of your operations really kind of reside in the general fund, okay? Your fund 21 is called the student activities fund, okay? That student activities fund is what we've been talking about. The, um, the fees and what we charge all go into this one fund. Then you have the tax increment fund, which is fund 26, okay? That is the, the, the RDA that we entertained recently. Any RDAs that we entertain, the tax proceeds and rebates that we give out are recorded in there. So anybody can look and see at the end of the year how much tax that we foregone by handing out these rebates, okay? Um, the fund 31 is our debt service fund. That is where we house the debt of the school district but that is only general obligation bonds, okay? So that's the ones that the voters approved. <coughs> then you go to fund 32, that is our capital outlay fund. That's where all of our capital projects are happening, right? Our construction projects, you know, if we paint something, the boilers, all those, you know, facilities type, you know, needs. Fences. Fences, bingo, all, all are charged out of this fund, okay? Then we're going into fund 40, which is the uh, building reserve fund. This is a fund that we've created that is where we're parking money that is reserved for capital outlay projects like the Shoreline School, like Tent View, like um, uh, Wasatch, okay? That is, we've parked money there and flagged it specifically for construction projects saying that we have a need for this. Uh, Fund 49 is our child nutrition program, okay? That's only child nutrition program and it's a federal program and we have to keep it there um, as a separate program, okay? Fund 55 is the municipal building authority, okay? That's the fund that we just had to create to go and issue the, gen or the lease revenue bonds for Shoreline and uh, Wasatch. The new fund is gonna be fund 77, it's the self-insurance fund, okay? Uh, that's for us when we move into self-insurance next year. This fund will be the, uh, started and actually started this year because we're gonna need to start the end the year with a balance and the fund created, so that way it's there starting the next year, okay? Do we know, is the bill that we were tracking one SB 183? It, it did not pass. Okay, it did not would pass. It, do we know if it would have affected us? It would have affected us. Okay. Yep. I, I got a response back from um, our attorney, not attorney, our our our, our, our uh, broker uh, consultant, and they had their legal department run it up, and they said, yeah, this would end up impacting us um, ab about not the full amount. It was about 20% of that amount. So um, that they, but they, it did not pass, and so we would still end up keeping the full amount. That we'll, of the rebates that we've been planning and projecting on. Derek, can I just ask on the building reserve fund, how 
like where when we put money in that reserve where we get that money from or is it you know it's just over and then is there a cap on how much we can put in a reserve fund right because i feel like in the past i have heard that like we can't just save all this money for future capital product Projects. Yep. So that is a complete uh, determination by the board. Okay. Okay. You can reserve and unreserve those as you see fit, right? And um, in terms of the maximum amount in the building reserve, there is no maximum. Okay. You you can, if you wanted to reserve and park away enough money to build a high school with cash, you absolutely have every authority to. Where the part that people like to say that you can't go above is called the undistributed reserve in the uh, unrestricted fund balance. There's a part in code that says you can reserve up to 5%, okay, okay and say that that's the maximum amount that you can reserve so that as um, essentially parked away as an undistributed reserve. And, and people mix that one little mm -hmm. piece of code up with other pieces, so. So that wouldn't apply to a building reserve fund? Correct. That's like an undesignated Correct. Fund. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yep. so when you look at our financial statements, this has been stripped way down, okay? And I've removed the numbers so you could just focus on the format. <laughs> it feels like there's nothing here. <laughs> stripped okay. nothing. Okay, so what you see here is this is in, the, in our financial statements, and I'm going to walk you through it. In our financial statements, this right here is a, a snapshot of what you'd see for our revenue, okay? And it's broken up by, here's the prior year's revenue, here's the prior year's revenue, here's the prior year, here's the final amended budget, and then here's the budget for next year, okay? And that's kind of, so we give a three-year trend plus the current year's amended budget, and then with the next year's budget, okay? And then we break it down by local sources. Local sources are gonna be tax proceeds, um, interest revenue and the fees that we charge okay then it breaks it down by state sources and state sources are the ones that the state gives us and allocates to us like the WPU class size reduction you know and those those types of things then you go into federal sources and your federal sources are going to be IDEA they're going to be um, your child nutrition um, you know, there's the, the, the ESSER funds, those are the, the things that are the federal money. So we've got to break it down by category, okay? So that way you can delineate the, you know, the difference. So expenditures, this is how we break down our expenditures. You have instruction, then you have your student services, then you have instructional services, then you have district administration, then you have school administration, then you have business, then you have operation maintenance, student transportation, food services, and community services, okay? So that's kind of how we group it, our expenditures, okay? Now, how does it look? Now, when you actually get to our financials, that is how it looks with the actual numbers in, 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 in there, and this is a high, high, high level summary. We actually give further breakouts of these by object code groupings too, but we'll save that for another time. Okay, so that way as you look at our financials, you can now at least see from a high, high level view how we bring in our revenue and how we spend it by those groupings, all right? Now, let's get into the descriptions, okay? So, this is the descriptions as per the state, okay? They set the, you know, how, they set kind of how the codes should be and the account structure should be and the description so that way we know hey we should be grouping these th costs here and here and here and here so instruction is, deals with activities dealing directly with the interaction between teachers and students so it's things that that's all costs pretty much that are inside the classroom right Student services is activities that are designated to assess and improve the well-being of students and supplement the teaching process. Instructional services are activities associated with assisting the instructional staff with the content and process of providing learning experiences for students. District administration, activities concerned with establishing and administering policy in connection with operating the LEA. School administration, activities concerned with the overall administrative responsibility for a single school. Business services, activities that support other administrative instructional functions. 
Can you give me an example of that? So uh, there's a further breakdown of this there. I, I just took the per first okay. sentence. So mm -hmm. here's really, I was gonna actually get into okay. what goes in here. So business services by state code includes my department, HR, Caleb's department, and Chad's department, so technology. So those are the departments that make up business services in, in the state code. Thanks. Yep. So then you have operation maintenance, and that's gonna be you know the our, our custodians and our maintenance crew, right? Then we have <coughs> student transportation, um, which is concerned with the conveyance of students to, to and from schools. And then you have food services, which are, are activities concerned with providing students food and staff at the school or LEA. And then community services are gonna be those other things that are like your fun, your foundation and you know other services provided to school age children not related to public education, okay? So that is kind of a description of everything. Now, when um, in, in your uh, folder, okay, Ooh, that's, there it is. In your folder, I've, I've given you the, the, pre the presentation, the Gantt chart, uh, the final JLC document. There's a document there with it taught actually a little bit uh, addressed, which is the Hattie effect size of visible learning. That is every last Hattie effect size um, through the research. And what you do, if you wanted to come in here and look, you could open this up and you can come in here and you can see what are the influences, whose domain is it, what's the subdomain, what's the impact to student achievement, and come on. You'll, you can get over here and you can see you know, the number of students in the assessment, the effect size, the overall confidence, and that kind of just gives you, you know, if you want to look at, hey, what are what's, what Todd was referring to and the educational research methods there that are that, uh, the visible learning, that's right there for your perusing also. Now, we'll get into the DOMO presentation. By the way, good job, business administrator, talking about Hattie stuff. That's <laughs> well done. Good job. While you're pulling it up, can I just say I've enjoyed looking at the graphs, which is weird to say, but Domo does a good job, and you guys do a good job. It makes things much clearer for me. Thank you. So this is, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is our district enrollment as of yesterday, okay? Um, and what you see is the numbers fluctuate. Um, if you'd actually logged in two, hundred, two days before, prior, and then today, yesterday to today, um, there were, there's actually a 200, uh, different, 200 student difference, and it's what you, there was an end of a try or an end of a semester just recently. So, which makes sense because that's you, know, you have your, your kids that were dropping and then coming back to in their in their for schedule for next year. So, which was actually really interesting. I was surprised. Like, I was like, why are we down at 13,300? What happened? <laughs> and that, that's what ended up happening. So, but this is essentially updating daily now. Um, this is the state right now with our district. It's at 13,573 students and is broken down by, you know, your different locations. Okay. So here's our student demographics and this gives you, you know, breaking down by your uh, demographic type along with the percentages over here if you look over here on the side right about here you can see that you know we're 58 percent Caucasian and then it kind of breaks down and you can even do that by school if you'd like right if, and it will it will change on the fly for you okay So this one is a, you also, you also have a historical trend of our district a lot by school. And this gives you the year and then it, it stacks it. So if you wanted to come and get a, a trend of what's happened um, each school, with each school, and you can do it by grade level also. So you can come over here and you can filter by the school and grade level. And you can see essentially what has, has happened over the, the, you know, from 2015 to last year, okay? Student uh, by enrollment by grade. Again, this is 
Um, this is just the current year right now snapshot, whereas the other one was the trend. Okay, so this one gives you that exact same kind of information, but just for right now. So this is our state AFRs, AFR expenditures, percentage by, uh, by fund. Okay, so this is our fund 10, and we can look over here, here's your functions. So this is our function, our instruction. We have about 59% of our expenditures are ending in the classroom, okay? And then if you go through our 2100 function, we have about 7% that goes to, uh, of our budget goes there. The 2200, we have 9% of our funding goes there. The 2300 function, we have about 2% that goes there, which is you know, about state average. The 2400 function, we are about 6% uh, of our budget and total resources go there. The 2500 function, we're about 4% there. Can you just help me understand, like, if I want to know what that means, because I don't know what the 2400 function yep. is, yep. show me how to do that. Yep. So here, here's what we're doing is we are, we're going to put in names here first, so that way, if you want, you can come back and read instruction, right? Right now, what you've got to do is essentially go back and go say, all right, here, what's the 1,000? And if you go back to um, so my presentation and you see this, there's your 1,000, which is instruction. Oh, I didn't put the what number in there. I was supposed to put the number like this in here. I apologize. Okay. So what I will do is I will update this spreadsheet or this presentation that include that number like that so you can cross-reference it back and forth, okay? And then and, and update that in that file. Thank you. Yep. So I went over 25s just barely. The 2600 function, um, there were about 12% of our resources are going there. And what is that? 2600 function is um, maintenance, operations and maintenance. 2700 function is student transportation, or 2% there. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have some of the lowest costs in the state Partly for transportation. Of We're very close, very condensed, a lot of, a lot of walking, that's correct. Uh, our, our staffing metrics do show that they probably need to increase about four um, if we were to, to go for the push to that, but they, they are showing there, yeah, we're, we're only allocating about 2%. So we are very efficient in our student transportation department. And then beyond that, below that, it kind of gets into other stuff that is, you know, not as many people report that. We see we've got 0%. We aren't using the 3300 function as much as other school districts do. So that's why that one's, there's not much there. But So that is essentially a, a state of where, you're, where things are at as of the 2021, uh, okay? Now, we are a year behind. Well, here's the way this works, okay? Is that state AFR is released statewide. Normally, they need release it every November for the prior year, right? So the 2022 should have been released by now, but the state hasn't yet. So that's why we're going over to the 2021. So when they release that, we will update all of this and it will be up there and essentially we'll- How come they're late this year? What was that? Why are they late this year? We don't know. We sent an email asking them try, before trying to get this, before this day, but they, they just said it wasn't ready. So I'm guessing it's just a lot of turnover. They, they've had a lot of turnover, so I'm guessing they're just, you know, they're trying to get their feet grounded. But when 2022 is ready, I will um, essentially, uh, when we get that in here and load it up, I will send out the notification. You'll get a notification that this has been updated. So our statewide average class size, as you see here, um, there's the state, the charter, and our district. Um, uh, and it gives you kind of overall by, by the, um, this is our, our secondary, where you, or sorry, the, not the secondary, this gives you by class by class breakdown, okay? Now, if we come over here to, let's see here. Yeah, that one is the secondary. So now here's elementary. Here's our elementary uh, class sizes as a comparison to some of the others that are around us, okay? 
And you can go in there and you can actually add other school districts in here if you'd like. You can also change and toggle by the year. Now you can see here, this one has 2023. How does this one have current year data, but the other one doesn't? Well, it all goes off of how they, the state collects their data and then sends out their information. So this is a report that they actually get off the October 1 count, which is already submitted and, and finalized, and they published it. So they, they have a quick turnaround time on this one, whereas the AFR, you can tell it's a long turnaround time. So that's, that's kind of what's going on there. So then you come down here, here's our middle school class sizes. That's the same thing. Um, you, can, you can toggle and switch by year along with the school district um, to, to get an idea of how our maybe science eight classes ought compare to the other school districts as an average class size. Do you know off the top of your head, does Ogden have, I used to know this information, but I can't remember. Do they have a, a similar size uh, yep. district as us, like yes. about 14, 15,000? Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I believe Ogden has much more Title I money than we do. Correct. But I may be wrong on that. That's so correct. So they're, they're more highly impacted. That, than is, co that is correct. Yeah. Yep. They, they are, I believe, in the top seven in in highly impacted of schools, and we're number in 19 state? in the state, and we're number 19. Really? Yep. We're only 19. Correct. How many total? What was that? How many districts? 41. 41. 41. 41. Yep. So we're just above half, which barely, but we're. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> I, I was surprised by that too, actually. But I mean, for us, we're we're 19th with about 44 percent. Okay. Alpine is like. 38th or 36th with 24. So, I mean, there's a huge drop from about 40, then boom, it really drops. So, Is most a lot, a lot of the rural, the rural. Most of your rural districts are going to be in in those highly impacted uh, numbers too. Correct. So that is those are the the main cards I wanted to kind of go over. Um, with Domo and what's in there. Is there any other questions that you've got? No, if not, then I'll move over into the next part of this. I have no question, but I actually have a comment, and this just echoes what Gina said earlier. I actually had was sitting next to a stranger at my son's J-Jazz basketball game, and we started talking about the school district, and he wanted to know how many kids were enrolled, and I literally pulled out my phone and pulled up the report and told him the exact number. So it was, has already been helpful for me as well. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. All right, so so budget assumptions. So the last year, this is the way what we're I'm assuming and we're assuming in our department as we build the budget for next year. Okay, that we're assuming raises for employees. Last year, um, the board agreed to do a three-year deal with the associations. Um, I've got a meeting set up next week to kind of discuss that, but um, uh, everything seems to be in order for everything to go smoothly again this year. Okay. Uh, so we're in, our, our intention is, is we want to increase our raises and salaries as much as possible for our teachers. Um, and, and, that, and that's not mine or the business, that's the district. Okay? Um, currently, uh, we're building out staffing ratios kind of for all departments to kind of just serve as a guide. Um, we have a 0% insurance increase for next year, and this will be the first year of our self-insurance. Okay. Um, we will need to allocate some of our fund balance to the insurance fund to start the next year, okay, just to make sure that we save solvent. Uh, the fund balance will decrease next year, and uh, our overall fund balances are going to decrease, but that's mainly due to a construction project. We've got big construction projects that are happening that are drawing our reserves down, okay, and so over the next couple of years, we will see our, those reserves all be, be coming down. Uh, and this will be the final year of the ESSER funds. No, sorry, not this year, the year we're talking about, FY24. <laughs> so, any other questions? What questions do you have? This is the most I have understood in any budget thing I've sat in. This is my third, but maybe it's just because I've been here longer, but this was a good presentation. Thank you.
Well, you would just remind me. I always get confused on this. You say FY24. Does that mean 2324 or 2425? 2425. 2425. Thank you. Yeah. I can never keep that. Sorry, sorry. 2324. <laughs> I, 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 I messed it Apparently up. Apparently, you can't keep it. I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the, when, when you, you say when you say the year FY24, it's the last, last the one it ends. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. One of these days, I'll get it, <laughs> and then I probably won't ever run for re-election. It won't matter anymore. But whatever. So I had a related question to that. So I'd heard. Some people say that our current year, like we won't have ESSER funds next year to continue stuff. So you're saying we do have some ESSER funds for next school year? Correct. This okay. year there's money that carries over. It ends in that year. It's the last year we can have any carryover that carries over to flush things out. This is the last year that we have available for carryovers to continue carrying over and use those funds. Okay, so after 25, 24, fiscal year 24 ends, that is done. We cannot allocate any more, but even if we have money left over, it's done and we can't charge anything else there. How much money are we talking? That's a great question. I don't have that number yet just because our projections right now, we're, we're kind of working through the, where we're going to end this current year, but we don't have, know that number yet. Of, we're, I, I'm assuming you'll get that information to us because yes. these are going to be some big decisions that will have to come up. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Derek. That was awesome. We appreciate all your work on that. Um, we are going to now have another presentation by Derek and Kyle Bates um, about our facilities rentals. How are we doing on time? We are five minutes early. Ooh. This is incredible. Good job, Derek. <laughs> We were quiet. I'm going to take off my badge so it's not rubbing up against the microphone. Does that work? You can hear me? Okay. Derek's just pulling up my PowerPoint. It's just a few slides. Um, he asked me as a director of building services to look at the uh, mutual use agreement we have with Provo City for the exchange of facilities to facilitate different programs, both for the um, school district and for the city of Provo. So um, you can go ahead and go to the second slide, Derek. Um, I reached out to Ryland Patterson, who is one of the individuals who coordinates uh, parks and rec programs for the city of Provo in our buildings and asked him for this school year what the usage looked like. And this is the table he sent me. Um, so you'll see the location on the left, the type of program that is in that building, and what um, rooms they occupy or what facilities they use, a description of the program, the time of year that it's in season, and then the approximate total hours that they're in our buildings. One of the adjustments I made, if you look here, where you see gyms one and two at Centennial and again at Provo High. I ran the numbers based on my experience at Centennial and these numbers over here were just the hours they were in the building. So I doubled those hours because they're using both gyms. So this 1200 number actually winds up being closer to 1700 hours a year that they're in our buildings. And they use, they used to use the, the elementary school some my understanding, talking to Rylan, is that they've done away with that after they opened the rec center and got programs kind of aligned and, and laid out. And they only use our secondary schools now, these five buildings. So all three high schools and the two middle schools. This, I apologize, is a little hard to read. Um, and I will definitely have this forwarded to the board by um, either myself or Derek, so you can go back through it. This is a, the school district's rental fee schedule I pulled off the uh, out of the policy manual and this is what I used I, I, I looked at three different possible ways of measuring impact and the first would have been actual costs that we would incur both on the city side and on the school district side and the problem with trying to measure the cost of uh, hosting these programs is there was no baseline data like what your expenses were before Parks and Rec came in and used your gyms, you know, 500 hours this year. 
The assumption, of course, is that when they're in our buildings and on our field spaces, there is an impact, and the impact does incur a cost. But there's no real way to measure that because there's no baseline data to differentiate. Like we used to spend this, and now we spend this, and so here's the increased cost. So the next thing I thought about was lost revenue, because that's also an issue. Um, difficult to measure in some respects, but there are examples where we will have renters contact an individual school wanting to rent a space that is not available because Parks and Rec is utilizing that space at that time. And the agreement we have with the city right now, and that we have had throughout my 17 years in the district, is that when there's a conflict, the city program comes first, and renting to a third party um, is the last priority. But again, it's hard to measure because even though at Centennial we would turn away renters, and I just talked to Brooke up there today, and she's like, yeah, I'd turn away you know, many renters every year because they want to rent a facility that's not available because the city is occupying that space. So there's lost revenue, but it's, again, it's really hard to measure because no one has tracked how many times we turned somebody away and what money we might have been able to generate had we been able to rent that space. So I settled, settled on, you can go ahead, Derek, and advance it. I settled on um, the measuring cost savings because it's, the mutual use agreement is we give them access to our facilities and field space for free, and they give us access to Kiwanis Park and the golf course and the rec center for free. I totaled up using the fee schedule um, and the hours they, and days they were in our buildings and what facilities they were using. This is an email I sent out, I think, to you, Rebecca, a few weeks ago. Um, I'll, I'll distill it all down. If you take the lowest rate we could charge um, a renter for the gyms or the wrestling room or the track and field, uh, the track or the football stadium, and multiply it by the hours they're there and include in an impact fee for heating, cooling, custodial, security, um, and issues like that, then the total cost savings for the city to run all their programs in our buildings each year is about $125,000 this year. In other words, had they had to pay us for what they were using, that's what it would have cost them. And that was the only way I could think to measure the agreement and, and what each party is getting out of it because it's the only thing I could put a, an actual number on. So, and that doesn't include, I added a few thousand dollars for the inevitable repairs and replacement of equipment that happens when they're in our building because things do break and things do go missing. But that's kind of a ballpark figure in terms of the cost savings the city enjoys because they use our facilities and field spaces for free. Um, what we get in return is access to Camp Big Springs each summer, uh, Kiwanis Park, which they use for cross-country meets, the rec center pool for swim teams, the golf course for the golf teams, and they have also taken on the responsibility of renting our field spaces. Um, and this is rentals they do to private members, to private third parties outside of this mutual use agreement for which these renters are charged a fee. And the fee, I think, probably comes from our fee schedule. But the issue there is that they schedule the usage. And periodically, Ryland will check with me to make sure that the renters aren't causing too many problems, because no one really supervises them. He schedules them, and then they just go and use the space. Whatever revenue is generated, the city keeps half. And at the end of the calendar year, the other half is forwarded to the school district. Um, so that's what we get. Really quickly about Camp Big Springs, because this is the only time I'm going to touch on this. I talked to Chad Duncan, who has directed our camp up there for, what, 15, 20 years now? We spend, as a district, somewhere between twenty dollars and $40,000 a year to maintain the platforms and to help with trimming trees or, you know, just access to the site, the safety of the site, the equipment for the site. Um, and the city provides us a dumpster for trash, wax, access to water while we're there, and then an access to a shed for storage purposes and the road in and out, which the city will grade and maintain at no expense to us. Um, it's my understanding they used to rent the site to other parties, but that no longer occurs, that they've maintained control of it primarily because they want the water rights from the springs. So that's 
what we get out of the agreement. Um, the ADs at 10th U High and Provo High sent me kind of a breakout of what their programs do. And these numbers are not exact, so I followed up with some of the individual coaches. And they're small adjustments. And this gives you kind of a, an idea. This is 10th U. So Timpanogos refers to Timpanogos Golf Course. That's the golf team. And then the pool is for the swim teams. And Kiwanis Park is what the cross-country teams use when they have a cross-country meet that's held here in Provo. So the top line is hours a day, then days a week, how many weeks in the season, and this includes both boys and girls. So some of these numbers are, you, you, you know, you double the numbers because there's two sports seasons, one for the boys team, one for the girls team. And then the months in the year when these programs are in season. Um, the golf season is not seven months long, but they play boys golf in the fall and girls golf in the spring. So it's two, three and a half month seasons. That's why that's that way. The swim season is six months long, goes from September to February, so it's very long. Um, and cross country, again, it's a fall sport, so it's more like three months, but that kind of gives you an idea of the, when you compare hours and the 1,700 hours there in our buildings, this is approximately how much time we spend in one of their facilities or on one of their field spaces. And that's temp view, so if you double that, you get kind of the district number, which would be yeah, about that. So 60% of what they, what, of the time they spend in our buildings. Um, this was the email from Mike Hunter, the AD at Provo High, telling me that they don't really, they use Qantas Park two or three times a year, but last year didn't use it at all. Um, but this year, excuse me, didn't use the park this year, but normally two or three times to, to host a cross country uh, meet. The golf team, and we'll get more into this with more specificity here in a second, the golf team does use Timpanogos Golf Course, and the swim team is in the rec center um, at least the five days a week. I think sometimes they may even have Saturday practices, depending. So that was his way of giving me their program usage. And you saw Tim use the slide before. Again, it's about 1,000 hours a year. So what does that mean? This is the golf, and I looked at the things. Camp Big Springs, honestly, is kind of a wash. We put every bit as much into that camp as the city does in terms of dollar amounts. So I looked at the three other programs that the Parks and Rec Director Scott Henderson mentioned in my meeting with him a few months ago. There really is no cost associated with cross country. They just run in the park a couple times a year and it's a public park. So I looked at swim and golf and it boils down to this. Um, the first two things I'll, I'll let you read when I send the slides out. I don't want to uh, prolong us any more than we need to, but the bottom figures are the important parts. The golf team receives free range balls and, and green fees for practices um, during the year. The, the golf matches, ironically, are not free. The region team hosting the golf, the region golf tournament at their site, which happens at Timpano's Golf Course, should happen four times a year, um, once each for the boys and girls teams at Provo and Timfew High. When you host that tournament, you pay for everyone who comes which is a cost somewhere between $1,400 and $1,800. So the host school will, will cut a check to Timpanogos Golf Course paying the green fees for all 70 players that play in the tournament that day. Um, sometimes the hosting golf course will give the, the players free buckets of range balls to practice before they compete. But the golf coach at Timview High said that's not even the case at all the golf courses. Sometimes the kids show up and either the school or the child has to buy a bucket of range balls to warm up and then pay green fees to play. So this, this cost saving down here is just for practices. They allow us to play rounds of golf and hit buckets of balls for free during the golf seasons. We save about $23,000 a year by not having to pay for those things. Um, the swim teams practice 15 to 18 hours a week and they alternate short and long practices so that they don't take the pool for the entire day. So one day, Provo High will have a two-hour practice, and Timothy will have like a 45-minute to an hour practice, and then the next day they swap. There are 83 total swimmers in our district. Um, the only thing I could think to measure was the cost of a youth pass that they would have to buy for a six-month season to access the pool for free or to get into the pool if they weren't allowed in for free. That would be a cost of $7,500 per year, and the cost to rent pool space for the pool, the the pool meets, excuse me, the swim meets they have two or three times a year 
would run another couple thousand dollars. So our cost savings are about thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year, based on the things the city actually gives us that you can put a price tag on that we get for free that we would otherwise have to pay for. Um, most common facilities concerns, in my experience as a principal and in talking to principals and athletic directors across the district that actually host these programs. There's a wear and tear on the gym floors because there's a lot of volleyball and basketball that goes on. Just so you know, to refinish, just sand and skim coat uh, a gym with a just a clear coat finish and not to take it down to the maple and redo it and repaint it, but just to refinish it is eight to $10,000 depending on the size of the gym. We just did the Thunderdome and one of the auxiliary gyms at Timview a couple months ago over Christmas break and it cost the district $16,000. So that's one of the things that we have to factor in is the impact on our gym floors because we, re, we refinish them pretty much once a year at a cost of about eight to $10,000 per gym if we contract it out. Damaged and missing equipment, which again, is hard to measure because it's very sporadic, but there are times when I, come, I would come to work and the PE coach would be waiting in my office and say, hey, Parks and Rec was here last night. One of my basketball standards won't work. I can't raise or lower it, or I'm missing three basketballs, or you know my office was open and something's missing out of my office. All sorts of stuff like that occurs. Again, it's sporadic and it, it's, you can't really measure it all the time, but it, it is an issue. Some of the bigger issues are custodial costs because the bathrooms are depleted by the patrons who come to watch games or practices um, and often bring other children with them. So the bathrooms, because they're in the buildings oftentimes after the custodians are headed home for the night or just as they're heading home, typically bathrooms have to be recleaned and restocked first thing in the morning to, to make sure they're ready for the students in the school day. There are heating and lighting and cooling um, costs that are associated with having the buildings in operation for extra hours. Uh, it's not uncommon. In fact, Brooke mentioned to me just today that Again, doors are left ajar, so there's security issues. Sometimes those doors will flap during the night in the wind and you'll get a false alarm and have to come up at two in the morning and walk the building with Provo PD. And then another one that we don't talk a lot about is just the, the supervision issue of not having school staff there. There's a custodian typically there for a portion of the evening, but the city provides a supervisor. And I went to the training last fall, they're good people and they're well-intentioned, but they do not supervise very well. I love them, but they just don't. And so a family will come to watch little Johnny play a basketball game, and the family will bring two or three other kids. Very common to have those kids just roam the building while mom and dad are watching the basketball game, and very difficult to, to control in some of our buildings because the gyms are adjacent to other spaces that we can't secure. So at Centennial, another good example, you can get all the way down to the auditorium once you get to the gyms, and nobody can stop you. So supervision becomes an issue and sometimes the kids trash the bathrooms or break a window or something and you don't even know until the next morning because no one's there when they do it. So those are some of the cons uh, facilities concerns we have on our side. Um, I want to add one to that, Kyle. We've had situations at both of our high schools where individuals who have rented the facility have used some of our equipment and not used it right, maybe created great gouges in the floor and that's another time that things it's not just a clear coat that can finish that. You've got to take it right down to the wood and then redo it again. So the, it's unfortunate when it happens. The people feel bad when they do it, but it happens not irregularly. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I just wanted to you know, give a, a moment for any questions anybody has before I touch on one more thing and then I'll, I'll sit down. But are there any questions about the mutual use agreement we have with Provo City or? How, how old is that? I've been here 17 probably years. Probably about eight years. What's that? Eight? Probably about eight years at this point. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I don't know about the terms of the agreement and how things have changed. I know when I first got in the district 17 years ago, there was an agreement that they would mow some of our field spaces and pay some of our water bill in exchange for access to our facilities. And that things like that have changed over the years. This current arrangement might be uh, eight years old, but I think we've shared our facilities with the city for well, for decades, honestly. And, so. And currently, we have no written agreements in place. They're just. They're like handshake. It's a handshake. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I just. I know this probably doesn't need pointing out, but there are reciprocal. Um, uh, 
costs for the city. I'm gonna guess with our awesome students at the rec center using the pool on their golf greens. Um, I've been to a lot of those cross country meets and help try to pick up afterwards sometimes when we have a lot of people. So this is a thing that goes both ways in terms of use and expense to maintain. Yeah, no, for sure. I, what I wanted to highlight was just, you know, what we're actually, what the agreement actually consists of and then the amount of usage, yeah. which it, it does heavily weight towards the city, but it makes sense because they run a lot more programs that require our facilities, whereas we have facilities for most of our own programs. Yeah. So, okay, that was going to be, I guess, kind of my question. You kind of answered it, but so do you feel like it's a pretty fair arrangement? I, I'm not saying I want to, I don't want to, mess things up with the city you know but i wonder is it a fair arrangement and then i have another a follow-up question after that <laughs> well so i've been on the principal side and i've been on the operation side i haven't been on the city side and lisa makes an excellent point which is there are certainly hidden costs on both sides of this equation like how much more frequently do we have to repair something or clean something up or restock something based on the usage I would say that based on the amount of hours we're in each other's facilities, those weigh more heavily on the district than on the city. And I do think it's more beneficial for the city than it is for the district from a purely financial standpoint. But there are other elements. There's the whole community aspect. There's the partnership. There's, you know, the one of the things you have to measure is, say we were to get rid of the agreement. Well, we would then have to find a pool. And to build and maintain right. a pool, is yeah. you know a very expensive thing. So while it may not cost the city very much to let us in for a few hours in the morning, because the pool, the rec center is already open, the pool's already prepared. Worst case, a few patrons don't get to use the pool at the time they want during swim practice. Um, and there may be a handful of people that then decide I won't join the rec center because I can't use the pool when I want to. So there is a cost, but the cost for the city to offer that is much, much, much less than for us to build our own pool. And if I'm being brutally honest, I think that's part of the reason we've kind of gotten into this situation where we're in an agreement that really doesn't benefit us the way it benefits the city because the things they do offer would be very difficult to replicate. We're not going to build our own golf course. We're not going to build a pool just for the 80 kids who swim. So, But no, I, I don't think it's equal. I think we have a lot more skin in the game, if I'm being honest. Okay. Okay, so then, and where we say we don't, where this is a handshake thing, is this something we feel like we need to put in writing? I mean, I feel like that would be the smart thing to do, but I also don't want to mess up relationships. And I don't, I mean, maybe that's something as a board we need to think about, maybe wanting to. Kyle, let me, yeah. let me try and answer that initially at least. Um, there have been conversations with the city, particularly the Parks and Recs Department um, over the years, that maybe it would be fair to sit down and really map out what are their contributions, what are our contributions, and then really evaluate that and then have that guide a written agreement. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to point out one small little point. Several years ago, I met with uh, one of the individuals who leads, who, who led at the time when it was called the Neighborhood Chair Program, uh, specifically to ask me if I would give permission for, um, for neighborhood chair meetings to occur in our buildings. I did give that permission. To the extent that that happened, I don't have any report on that. I have no idea. But that's another aspect that potentially could be on your list that wasn't. I, so, I can yeah. say I remember one in the last five or six years that a neighborhood meeting happened at like Rock Canyon. I've been to one at Franklin. Yeah. Oh, so, the they were meeting. very regularly at Franklin. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and it, is, it is on the fee schedule. Those are complimentary services we provide, I think, by statute to political parties or organizations. Um, and that's another part of the impact on our buildings. It is. Um, we're also polling places. There's a whole host of things to go into it, but you know, Superintendent Rattel makes an excellent point, which is were we to put something in writing, we would have it would have to have some specificity to it. It's it's I'm not a big fan of Lucy Goosey, but when you really start getting down to brass tacks and, and looking at day by day, hour by hour, program by program, facility by facility, it's it's very complex and I'm not sure there, well, I, I would be hopeful we could have a conversation that was honest and, and, and collegial, but at the end of the day, if you enter, enter, if you enter into that agreement, there's only two possible outcomes, right? You either continue to do what we're doing now and just put it in writing for the sake of clarity, or at some point in that process, you recognize that 
we're being more heavily impacted, and then you seek some sort of you know, remuneration or compensation for it, and then the conversation becomes, well, what's it worth? What, what would make it balanced? Um, or does the city simply say, well, then if we can't have access to these facilities at this level, we'll just scale back our programs. And nobody wants to do that because one of the great things about Parks and Rec, even when they destroy a bathroom, <laughs> is there are kids who only ever play or, or do things through the rec program, right? Not everyone gets to be a high school athlete. Same way not everyone gets to be a college athlete. So we want to be a good partner. I just wanted, I, I've been here 17 years and this is the first time I've really dug into minute by minute, day by day, what's happening in our schools and what is the co possible cost of that? What's the actual cost savings? What are, what's the lost revenue? There's a lot of pieces to this. I, it would be nice, I think, to get it in writing on some level, so just for the sake of clarity, which is why I took some time to do some digging so you guys kind of know, at least from a facilities usage and programmatic standpoint, Parks and Rec versus our high school athletics, this is what's happening now. And certainly other things go along with that. So I, I have a concern. Mm -hmm. Same. When you're done, Terry, if I'm next. If a kid <laughs> is playing junior jazz at one of our facilities and gets hurt and then they sue, who are they going to sue? We don't have a, a legal document saying we have an actual agreement with the city. And so nobody, they're going to sue both of us. I covered that a few years ago with risk management. And the risk management does cover us. Uh, we, we probably want to check on that every now and then just to make sure it's constantly yeah. renewing. And if we have an actual contract with the city, that might help. It if might. It's just a handshake agreement. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing about getting something in writing, um, Rebecca, President Nielsen, I, I'm not sure how formal we are I here. I prefer President Nielsen. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Your Highness President Rebecca's Nielsen. Rebecca's great. Thank you. <laughs> Your worship. Um, <laughs> I think one of the benefits of putting something in writing would be that periodically you would have to sit down and review it for accuracy and clarity moving forward. And to that end, Derek and I have begun monthly meetings with the rec department, Parks and Rec department at the rec center to touch base on key issues and make sure we're being transparent with each other, communicating more frequently and more effectively, and that we're all on the same page with whatever we do. So the fencing project, I met with them for months before we ever started that. Um, going over programs, Camp Big Springs, and all the rest of the stuff we've just covered, and and putting something in writing and then ma maintaining that would would be a reason that would encourage us to continue those conversations moving forward, which I think have been very helpful. Scott and Doug are awesome, so. Well, the more communication, the better, always. Right? Yeah, yeah, for okay, sure. Okay, so can I can I address another thing? Dig a little deeper into one of one of the aspects of the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you said that, and help me just make, confirm this first. The city rents out our facilities mm -hmm. for us yeah. on the elementary or the secondary level. Rylan and I kind of negotiated that, and this is my first year here, so I wasn't aware this was even happening. But they, somewhere along the line during this gentleman's agreement, they have acquired the responsibility of renting our field spaces. So they will take a phone call from adult, an adult soccer league. That's one example. We have several of them. And the person on the other end will say, I want to run a soccer league. We need a field big enough to, to map out a soccer field on three nights a week and four Saturdays over the next month. Rylan will quote them a price. They'll write him a check. He'll schedule a field. And then at the end of the calendar year, they give half those revenues back to us. Okay. Um, and then so Rylan and I will talk about this last summer, for example, mm -hmm. and it was so hot and dry. I told them you can't rent Westridge anymore. There's no grass on the on the field. We're destroying that property. So he'll stop renting that at, at our request. Um, but yeah, they just call the, the city offices. They put them through to Ryland. Ryland puts them on a, a schedule, collects the money, and then at the end of the year, again, gentlemen's agreement. I have no idea how much money they actually get. There's no reason for them not to be honest with us, but they just gave us a check for 8,000 bucks. So last calendar year, 2022, they collected 16,000 and some change in revenues from renting school district property after hours. And it's just mainly elementary is what Keith was saying, right? Not yeah, secondary? The, the mainly yeah. it's elementary. The secondary will generally uh, rent out there. I don't know where middle school is on that, Todd. Maybe you do. Well, the park behind Centennial is City Park already, Sertoma, right? right? right. So, that one's not ours. But they, in Dixon, I think, I, I'm not aware of much going on at Dixon, but the heavily used ones were Lakeview, Westridge. Um, I'm trying to think what other elementary schools. Yeah, yeah, since it has been used. So they have big enough play spaces that you can chalk out a soccer field, for example, or ultimate frisbee. And then these adult leagues that are 
after the rec program ends, if you want to keep playing and you're not a professional athlete, you get into these adult leagues. And some of them just run their own leagues, and they need a place to play. So they call us, cut the city a check, come play. Um, my concern there is there's no supervision whatsoever. Ryland just says, OK, it's going to be 500 bucks. Drop a check off, and you can hop on the field next Monday. And there's a lot of undocumented use of our fields. Well, and, and it, would it be to our benefit to bring that scheduling back in-house and have control of our own fields? Again, I would think yes. Yeah, we had we moved it out. To do I, that. I just want to respond to that. We had moved it out simply because um, Mark Wheeler and, and Iridana was, they were the de facto scheduling department in addition to all the other things they were doing. We just didn't have the personnel to get it done. So the city said, we'll take that off of your hands, but we would like a, a cut. So that, that was why we established the agreement we did. I think yeah. things might also change when they open up their huge complex that has a lot of soccer fields and things like that. So it will be time to revisit that anyways. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I have talked with uh, Idiotna about scheduling. As things stand today, she's willing to take on the scheduling. Um, last year, I think the amount was about 8000 This year, it doubled to sixteen. I think pre-pandemic levels of outdoor activity are kind of returning. So moving forward, there's you know fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year we could recoup if we schedule our own field spaces and collect that revenue ourselves. So well it's an interesting question, Alice, because the city no, doesn't supervise them right now. No one does. Well as I talked to Parks and Rec, they didn't no, that was never part of the I mean, agreement in their mind. But that's something we could add if we right? put this all in writing, right? Because yeah. it's something that should probably be happening. Okay, can I, I can I ask one more question? Yep. Sorry. You were saying like damage would be done to our school and vice versa. So, you know, we might leave some damage if we're using Kiwanis Park or the, if, if damage happens, do we charge it to the other person? Typically no. Um, and it's because it's very difficult to ascertain when and where, when exactly and who exactly broke something. In my experience, like at Centennial, one day I came to work and the basketball standard in the gym was broken. Coach tells me when I went home yesterday, it was fine. Parks and Rec was in there five hours that night. Next morning he comes in, it's not working. I called Parks and Rec. We have no idea what happened, right? So that's part of the, the difficulty is at the end of the day, if you don't know exactly what happened and who did it, we're left to make those repairs ourselves because we, we the, we're the ones that need the basketball standard to work, you know. And in fact, in that particular instance, I got several follow-up calls from the Parks and Rec asking me, have you fixed it yet? Have you fixed it yet? We got games. So, you know, it's, it, that's a kind of, and, and, and Brooke made an interesting comment when I, met, when I met with her this morning about this issue. She said, you know, I talk with Ryland Patterson almost as much as I talk with Dr. McKee, with Todd, and, he, and she said, but the difference is when I talk to Todd, is we're talking about teaching and learning. When I talk to Ryland, we're talking about Parks and Rec. And she said, it just doesn't have anything to do with how our school is functioning. So there's a bit of a, an organizational drain because when they need something and they're going to be in our building, they will communicate and ask for that. And we want to partner with them and get that done. But it's, it's really just a favor, right? So there's a, there's a cost associated with the agreement. And, and the schools, I do think, bear it more heavily than the city. But... I think there are things we could do to clean it up and make it more transparent and more clear without necessarily ruffling feathers. Like I said, I meet with Doug and Scott every month. And every month they buy me J-Dogs, and every month I think I shouldn't have one. It's not good for me. And then I eat two, and we have a great conversation. <laughs> and so it's been really good. They're, I mean, they're good people, right, just like we're good people. But I think sometimes it's like family, right? If you're not really clear with how things should be, then when something unexpected happens, you can get into a bad situation pretty easily because there's nothing that's been spilled out. You're all just sort of winging it every day, right? So. Okay. Can I can I keep digging? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, how about our our ghost renters, meaning the people that use our facilities without our permission and without our knowledge? and without a rental agreement in place, because I know that's happening mm -hmm. like all just over the place. Yeah. yeah. It, it's happening inside the buildings. It's happening outside the buildings. And it's one of the reasons why I asked about all this in the first place, because I see people profiting off of our facilities. Yeah. And when we're already, when we already have just a handshake agreement and it's not as much in our favor and it's just costing us a lot. And I know we have 
same taxpayers, Provo City, but th but this maybe even goes beyond now we're talking them. We're not talking about these two nonprofit organizations. We're talking about people who profit off of us, oh, yeah. which is one of the reasons why I ask if bringing our rental stuff back in-house can help us control that better. And if it does maybe require some more supervision, maybe we can get better eyes on what's happening inside our buildings at all times. Because I can guarantee you, and I've seen it with my own two eyes multiple times, people are profiting off of us at our expense. And, and it's bothersome to me. Like, it's yeah. frustrating to me. When we have to go out and do a big truth in taxation to pay our teachers, yet we're losing money. I mean, you know, like this, is, I mean, I... I'm sure that could not cover the raise for the teachers. However, like every penny counts, right? Oh, yeah. Like, and so that kind of thing is one of the reasons why this whole discussion has been prompted in the first place, right? So yeah. So the fencing project is meant to help facilitate more secure field space. And now, if you don't rent it and can't get in, you're going to have to hop a six-foot chain-link fence to get on our field. And hopefully, that'll dissuade the casual user of the field spaces. But you're right. I happen to know also firsthand eyewitness for-profit Bantam League and Super League programs and volleyball, basketball, whatever, using our gyms in a for-profit scenario, and some, in some cases our field spaces for football, um, under a for-profit scenario off the books. And I'll add to your concern one other layer, and I'm not going to name names because that's not why I'm here, but some of our school personnel are involved in that. Oh, that's where I see it. And that's it's an where ethics I violation. See it a lot. Yeah, how do they get into the schools? There's a, so there's right? a they lot have of keys. school If they're in the school. school personnel who have keys and feel at liberty to just use it at their will and they use it or loan the keys to others loan the keys yeah. to other people and there I, are there are for profit little groups that are yeah. coming in making money off of our and leaving us a lot of wear and tear yeah. and and at my school the 10 years I was there again I won't name names but a former employee who was in the PE department and had keys and knew when the gym was available because they were familiar with not only with our utilization but the parks and rec programs come in after hours, practice their basketball team, be the coach, collect money, all of it. And so there's insurance issues, because some right. of these people there's are insured, so some aren't. There's liability there. There's, like, yeah, and there's the wear and tear on the building, mm -hmm. and then there's the issue of the ethics violation for the public employee who may be in a for-profit situation off the books and is not renting that space, which leaves us open to liability and them open to losing their license. So yeah, it's it goes on. So seeing the problem, what are you asking? like? that we do about it. I, I don't know what the solution is, but I wonder if maybe bringing that rental, situ the, the facilitation of the rental, uh, uh, or the management of the rentals in-house could help, or maybe increasing the supervision that we're talking about that we don't have. I mean, people understand we don't have supervision. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's I, easy for them to take advantage. Yeah. With keys now, are getting into the building is using something like this. Mm -hmm. So do we know who swiped and at what time? Hey, Chad. Do we keep an electric, electronic archive of the bad swipes at all the schools? So like if I yeah. swipe, you know that I swiped oh, this yeah. building at, oh, yeah. at 8, 8 05 this morning. Yeah, the, the problem we have at some of our schools, the problem at Centennial was this particular individual had a key to the, the back door of the gym and it was a key. So there are some security issues wrapped up in this. There's some supervision issues. And I think, Rebecca, to your point, um, what I would ask, knowing a little bit of both sides of this equation, mm -hmm. I think our athletic directors and coaches need to be our first line of defense, especially the ADs. They need to walk the building in after school hours. And if that means they get to school at 9 or 10 instead of 7.30, the athletics programs are all afternoon and evening endeavors. Right. And at the middle schools uh, where some of this is happening, either an, an administrator or some other faculty member has to go through and just walk the building and tell people, hey, you don't belong here, you need to leave. Yeah. So, we and we have security tape too, so. With our employees, right? Right, yeah. Maybe we need to reemphasize the policy with the employees as well. I don't mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely things that can be done, I'm sure, to kind of yeah. clean it up. I, yeah. I'm not sure officially what all those solutions are, but that is something I would love to be, have, be looked into more. For sure. Um, one last quick slide, and I won't, go into this in any depth, but just so you know, for the first time that I'm aware of in the history of our school district, my department is creating an electronic asset inventory of all the equipment and material that the district owns, maintains, replaces, services, utilizes to keep schools running. Um, and we're putting those assets into this spreadsheet. We're gonna dump them into our asset management program, the Brightly program. 
So we can start generating replacement work orders and PM work orders that we're going to have for the first time an electronic inventory of everything we own, boilers, chillers, rooftop units, controls, flooring, paint, carpet, everything. This is Amelia Earhart, the first school we did. It's going to wind up being somewhere between five and 10,000 individual assets that will go into this system. Amelia's got about 100 to 150 just on its own as a small elementary. But there are thousands of pieces of equipment that we have to keep operating to keep schools running. And everything we know about them is in someone's head. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put them in a system. Derek got this going for us. So we can track our assets electronically, do more preventative maintenance instead of waiting for something to break and then just fixing it, and do life cycle replacements. So we, we start servicing things instead of repairing and replacing things instead of waiting for them to explode and then waiting eight weeks to get a replacement and putting Band-Aids on stuff all the time. So does it have like when it was put in? Yeah, if you, I just took a screenshot. You can oh. slide to the right and there's a install date, uh, the standard life cycle of that piece of equipment based on industry standards. There's a purchase cost, a replacement cost, all sorts of other fields. But we'll have that information on every toaster on up throughout the entire district eventually. We hope to get it done by this summer for all 18 of our schools. And then the system will start telling us, hey, it's the 21st of March, time to go up to Canyon Crest and change the filters on this rooftop unit or whatever. So. We'll be, we'll be more into servicing things instead of waiting for things to break and then repairing them. And we have to do this for a million reasons, not the least of which is the lead time on some of this replacement equipment is months or years. It takes two years to get a chiller from train. And so if you have a problem with the chiller, you can't get one from train for two years. So then your option is put a band-aid band -aid on the one you got and hope it doesn't break too badly or go to another vendor who can get you one in six months instead of two years. So this will help, I hope, I hope get us out of that crisis management mode we've been in for, for quite a while. So we're working on that as well. Great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you so much, Kyle. We appreciate you being here and all the work you're doing. Uh, great work. We are supposed to be, oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought you were talking, okay. Supposed to be on break until 2.15, so we get six, six full minutes. See you back at 2.15.
Thank you. Okay, everybody, we have one last item on our study session to complete before the day's over. So if we could get started, that would be awesome. Okay, welcome back everybody. We, we have, like I just mentioned, one last um, item to talk about today, which is the board priorities list. Um, so, as you guys know, I um, asked for everyone to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, um, and my ask was to give me your top five things you wanted to try and accomplish in the near future um, with the board. And so I've made uh, a list. I got, I got six six um, out of seven responses, and so I think we've got a pretty good list here to work with. Um, and I tried to take this list and kind of categorize it into different areas, what we might be looking at. Um, and then I, on the, on the right-hand side, gave Keith some, um, a, an assignment here to, to kind of help us with like an estimated scope or timeline or context or kind of any details that might be relevant in helping us decide how we want to prioritize this and what we may want to work on um, first, second, third, et cetera. Um, so let's go ahead and just dig into this document. Would everybody Has everybody had a chance to read it? Do you want me to go through each of the items or should we just go ahead and discuss? You, you do want me to, Gina? No, 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 no. Oh, saying, I think we've just, all had a chance. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. So then, I guess what I'll do is just open up the floor for discussion here, um, and and I'll just ask what what you all feel is maybe the most important, um, and what we should start with. I'll I, I guess I'll go ahead and start. I'm gonna say my number one thing that I feel like is maybe the most important that I think we need to work on, especially with the fact that we'll be getting a new superintendent shortly, um, in my opinion, is probably the visioning um, section here. I think we have a really great opportunity with the new superintendent coming in and kind of a, 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 it's just a good chance to kind of reset our goals, our vision. We've talked about multiple times going just different on a, maybe on a board level, doing board goals, mission and vision statement. We've also had the suggestion to do a full strategic vision type thing for the entire school district. Um, but in my opinion, I think the timing on that would be just right with a new superintendent coming in um, and taking the time to do that. And that, in my opinion, is maybe our number one. But that's, that's me. So I'm happy to hear from each one of you. Tell me what you think and where you feel like we should go from here. Some of these, again, are broad and are like very project-based and will take a year or two. Some of them I feel like we could do pretty quickly, you know, and so these don't, we don't have to do one at a time. We could overlap some of these as well. Anybody else have any thoughts? Gina. I, I like your thoughts about visioning. I think, I mean, obviously there's some things that we can do in the meantime, but we need, we need to figure out board goals and is it gonna be board goals or district goals? Or are they the same thing? Like. When I was trying to help with the brochure, I was like, what are we, we, we seem to, we need to, we need to get our messaging in line, which is, which came out very clearly in the feedback that we got from the community and from our, our folks. And I think if we can get our visioning 
in line, that will help us get everything else in line. That doesn't mean we can't work on some of these other things, but I, I think if we figure that out ourselves and, and put that in place. But then my question is, do we, do we wait till we get the news, till, till Keith is on the shores of Oahu, basking in the sun? <laughs> or do we, or do we start now? I like, think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I think the truth of the matter is, Gina, there's a lot of prep work that may have to happen before we can start anyways. Like, I okay. think, it, in my opinion, it, ma it makes sense that we do, in my head, it seems like the, the process of visioning would be somewhat similar to what we've been doing with the superintendent search, where we have a consultant, we have a helper from the outside guiding us through this process. And I mean, just to even start looking into consultants, we could do now. I mean, you remember how long that took yeah. with superintendent search, right? I, so I was going to say, I, I, I like this, but if we're going to do this, I think we need an outside consultant. If you guys, did any of you go to the USBA? Where, yeah. Was yeah, it the Canyon? Canyon? Yeah. They hired somebody, and I really think that that would help us, especially, I think, we're seven very different individuals, and if we tried to do this on our own, we're, it's going to get nowhere. Well, right. it will be a lot of work for us, no matter what, right. as a board, but it's nice to have some guidance, but go ahead. Yeah, Mary. just what you're saying, like the outside consultant helps kind of give you the skeleton and guide, but it sounded like that board was really involved too, right? Yeah. It's not that So we would need to understand involved. we'd be committing to mm -hmm. And it's not something these, that's yeah. going to happen in two weeks. This yeah, is going to be a year-long year process, process, probably. Um, and we put in the superintendent's um, application well, in the brochure about it, that one of the things is we want the new superintendent to help conduct a SWOT analysis, or you know, what are our strengths, weaknesses. That that kind of stuff is what is used for then setting the direction and the goals and stuff like that. So, I definitely think we need to do the majority of the work with the mm -hmm. new superintendent. Absolutely. If I can also suggest, um, it was very helpful to me the first year that I was here that PEA decided that they would take the lead in running a climate uh, survey of all staff. And um, that might be something that will help the new superintendent as well. If you want to, Jason usually is the person who's uh, most in touch with PEA. And if uh, you wanted to do that, probably fall would be a good time for that. So planning for it now wouldn't be a bad idea. And I, I also want to point out we have 100 and 30 something pages that was just from our employees of their open ended responses. So, besides the data, um, those are just open ended comments, right? And, and that there is so much information in there, we have to use that. So, having someone help guide us in how we use that, just getting more and more and more comments might be helpful. And, and there might be, you know, there are for sure better and other questions to ask, but. I don't want to just let that data just sit there, especially because it's there's a lot of themes that emerged that are so specific around things that we need to be doing differently or that we need to enhance the way we do right now in our district. Mm -hmm. So for me, a priority is to look at that data and use it in this way to make sure we have a clear vision and direction of where we're going to focus, I mean, as we're talking about budget and every, everything we're doing, we need to know what our priorities are because then when decisions that are hard have to be made, we can be guided by those priorities and how we make those decisions and we can communicate that clearly to the community. Mm -hmm. I guess I would segue on that one. Uh, another priority for me is the financial data stuff. We're lagging still, even with the $4,200 we're going to be giving. Everybody in the state's getting $4,200, so we're still at that same lag. Uh, you know, we've got to look at our budget priorities for teacher salaries, too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the one of the items specifically determining our budget priorities, right? Um, I added the note on this one. I felt like this one had a shorter timeline. Like we might be able to do this on top of other things that we're doing or whatever. And I think that the process has kind of already started quite a bit with Derek's budgeting process and things you're looking at and analyses you're doing and whatnot. So that's something I think we could easily put in with other things that are happening, right? That That is something we should be doing this time of year every year, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about but next year's budget. But I think it's 
hard to do it if we don't have a clear set of district priorities because mm -hmm. every single thing is good. Right. So, th and there's a reason we need all of it, but if we don't have the funding for all of it, those bigger, harder decisions are longer. They don't happen, in, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if they involve other systemic changes, that's, a, that's not a couple meetings. So that's probably separate than our current budget decisions, which we right. do need to make around teacher salaries, et cetera. Um, on on that same line, did you have, go ahead. I was gonna change topics. Well, along that same line, one of the, on, and, and in regards to one of Keith's notes, one of the items that a couple people requested, including myself, is a full DLI audit. And I think that goes along with that same vein. I think a lot of us have been asking and looking at and wondering what can we what can we cut? Especially after I feel like especially after we did our last truth and taxation and the public really made it very clear we need to sharpen our pencils, which was the exact term that was used over and over again. Um, that's one program I think we can we need to take a hard look at and do a good, big analysis on and is it working like we planned? What are the actual costs associated with it? So that's that's another one I think that could help us with our budgeting question. I agree. Uh, yeah. I have a, like a year ago I went and asked around uh, after looking at different uh, school district boards uh, websites and asked them their questions and it, it was kind of clear, they, talking to them made it clear, our priorities and our visioning and everything can be completely separate than our board goals. Board goals should be short, envisioning and everything long term. So I would suggest that by the June meeting, we make goals for the next school year. Sorry, in the back behind you going like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we make, uh, yeah, if so everybody can hear me now. In the June board meeting, we make goals for next school year and they don't have to be a lot you know one board said they made one goal and that was it so are you are you talking about because we have our board goals right yeah like those aren't general, those aren't real board goals those that's are like our goal. more of our like our board like guiding mm -hmm. yeah that's a whole yeah. yeah but board goals there's something short that's a, measurable attainable Probably. measurable mm -hmm happen in one school year. So I saw a post from a, a Jordan school board member who said they have priorities. I don't know how many they have, but each board member could vote on two or something. And then those, whatever the two were that won out was what the board focused on that year. I don't know if that's something that you're, yeah. but they didn't call them goals, they call them priorities. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what we're and one of the right now, right? What of those do we want Yeah. On this list? Right. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, something that, thought we talked about, but I didn't, maybe I skimmed it and didn't see it, but I do think figuring out the Dixon property should be so, a priority. Okay, so let me clarify. I did not, there were some things that were requested that I didn't include in this list oh. because it feels like we're already starting that process. So the Dixon property was requested okay. by a few people, but we've already kind of started in on that process and we're already working on it, so I didn't include it here. I can, I, it can absolutely be something that we say we want to keep at the top of our list, but I feel like we're already in that process, so it'll just happen. Did that include an audit of boundaries in the school? Uh, I feel like the Dixon thing is like the epicenter of yeah. so many so things. So boundaries, is boundaries not on here? School boundaries, boundaries right there. School boundaries. So boundaries is another one that was said by a lot of people. Um, and yes, Dixon is kind of at the heart of that school boundaries discussion, or the, the you know the casual discussions that have come up about that. So that's another thing we can start looking into. That's another one that would take a lot of time and it would require a lot of study before we could even really make some decisions there. Yeah, we need a boundary study before we let go. And um, uh, also, let me, sorry, one more thing I just wanted to clarify, sorry, Meg, um, <laughs> it was that there are actually some things on this list that nobody requested, but that we actually talked about adding into our priorities list, which was, which just one thing, which was the school start times. We had said, well, we'll put it on our priorities list, but interestingly enough, not a single board member actually had that in their top five. So I did include it because we had talked about it, 
but it was not an actual request from anyone in there. But is that, would that fall under, we already have kind of started, restarted that conversation, like the Dixon site? Kind of? It could, yeah. We, but the determination on that was, let's see, well, let's prioritize it. Let's put it in our priorities list. And I don't know if we said that it was a priority, though. I think we were like, we just need to have more information from yeah, the, we'll the, the, we need to get more information from the community before we move forward. So I guess, I guess that so that's why I added it, because if we want to move forward and actually go out and survey the community about school start times, I guess we yeah. would want to add that to the list. So right? when we talked about it at our last meeting, it was like, well, when should we bring it back up? And Rebecca said, let's add it to today's discussion and then see where it falls of how soon on our priority we feel it's a priority to get right. to it. Right. So anyway, so, so that is on here, even though it wasn't a top five of any board member. And Dixon is specifically is not here because I felt like we've already started that and that's already in motion. So I hope that's okay with everyone. But if so, Dixon is Dixon's already already moving. I lumped that in with the school boundaries and figuring out our facilities. I I feel like a whole bunch of these are all related to each other. Like, are, right, I know. Like start <laughs> time <laughs> boundaries, DLI yes. audit. Uh, Let's do Dixon, uh, like they're all related, like how do we separate them and talk to them about them individually or do we talk about them as a whole? Right. I think inform, that's where the vision comes in. Informing. Maybe that's where visioning comes in, right, where we, I, anyway, it was kind of tricky to categorize these, by the way, because I was like, well, this one could go in six of these, and <laughs> so, so I understand what you're saying, because they all overlap. Yeah. I'm wondering if any of our district council has any, um, advice on that so when they do overlap and yet we don't have capacity to study all of these and some of them have some time sensitive kinds of things so, like Dixon. Anyone want the floor? Yeah. Want to give us your two cents? Well I think you could put them apart. I mean facility usage seems to be where the Dixon property question originates so that's one area you could talk about facilities and properties. Um, I think school start times have a degree of being a separate conversation. I'll pass it on. DLI could be a very separate conversation. Um, we do have a we do have an audit from an academic perspective that was completed two years ago that I can that could inform us or start that conversation. I'll turn it over to the. Wait, Amber, uh, sorry. Can you clarify that? We, you, there was an academic audit of the DLI program. Mm -hmm. I would love to state, have that information. State, no, that we within our department had done. That would I would love to have that information. I'll send it to the board right now. Board, I just sent to you a document that I prepared a little while back. Just some thoughts about um, some thoughts that you be, need to be aware of if you're going to be considering school boundary changes. And uh, this is probably more from a political as well as a functioning standpoint. So it's there for you to think through. Can I, I just wanted to say when I'm thinking personally about priorities and looking at this list, especially after the time we've spent with all of the input we just gathered, I would just say, and this, again, maybe this is under visioning, but moving forward for me, like the two priorities are focus on student achievement how are we doing? Do we have clear school improvement plans? Um, are we are we really supporting those plans enough? And then the second one is, how are we supporting our teachers? We have an overwhelming <laughs> amount of data right now from the teachers asking for more than, it's not even just salaries, it's a tiny piece of what we heard, right? So how are we supporting our teachers? And so for me, those two things, student achievement and really getting in and supporting our teachers, those are my two top priorities and that would go under vision or under anything but what other we have to do with our facilities and our other things to make those two things top for me that's where I would start. Okay. All right. Meg, I feel like you have had so much to say and I keep cutting you off. Do you have more you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah, I'm thinking. So what I'm thinking is if we, we set priorities, that may just guide, because some of these pieces are going to support those priorities, right? I think when we talk about boundary changes, what that is is, okay, what facilities are being underused, underutilized, okay, and that's gonna, that may inform Dixon, right? Like what that use is gonna look like. When we talk about the DLI programs and looking into those, I think that's, there's a piece coming from a financial aspect, would that support 
teacher pay in a way. I mean, that actually, it's, that is probably a, too long of a term. That would be years in the process, depending on what the studies find. Um, so it also seems like a strategic planning visioning could be a long process where we get a consultant. But what Terry's saying, I think within that, we have some short-term goals, right? You make a goal for this next year. We're going to focus on what are ways we can support student achievement and our teacher pay within what we can have some control over while we're doing the overarching re kind of recentering as a board what our vision and goals are, which may be different than in a sense from the district in the sense that we as a board have a superintendent and business administrator, right, that we, um, those are our employees, is that how the best way to put it, that we need a way to be measuring how effective they are and what we are wanting to see and then our policies, right, informing how the district is run with having lots of input from the professionals that do this, right, where I'm not a professional. So I guess I think we should maybe move forward with, okay, we need a strategic planning, consulting, let's look into that. In the meantime, what are our short-term goals for this next coming year and prioritize priorities? And then what, and this list are going to kind of move us to those priorities? That makes a lot of sense because if you were saying like, so for the next year we're going to focus on increasing teacher salaries, that's going to force conversations around facility use, that's going to force conversations around a, a whole lot of other, you know, things that would have to be levers you've looked at to support that goal of figuring out how within our budget without, you know, doing the things that we don't want to be doing with taxpayers how could we really make, move the needle on teacher salary, for example? Like, I'm not saying that has to be it. Right. Can I say one more thing? For Please, say just all the things you want. <laughs> say five more things. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting used to this. Okay, um, DLI, though, I think that it should be clear, like if we are you know, moving forward looking into that, I think this is also something that many in the community support and really value. And I think when you look at that in relation to House Bill 215 um, and other opportunities for students, whereas we as a district continuing to provide opportunities. I mean, I do personally would like to include in that, like looking at equity issues with our DLI programs within schools, right, too. But I think if we're going to, as a district, maybe that audit will also look at how can we better support our programs, how can we make them more equitable um, and make sure we are honoring the value that community members do see in the DLI programs as we're moving forward with something like that. Yeah. So Looking at it doesn't mean that we're putting it on a chopping block. Sure, right. and that's kind of what it's, I just want to be We've had this program. We've what is people, it doing? We've what had are, people graduating yeah. through the program. Is it, is it successful? Is it, yeah. 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 Right. And what's what are the results, right? Which brings us to communication. How do we communicate it? Oh, they're, they're all related. <laughs> yes, they're all related. <laughs> Every last one of them. Okay, so... Um, if I'm going <laughs> to, it go from here. feels like, it feels like most people agree with, we need to look into getting a consultant and working on some visioning goals. Are we wanting to do that just for the board or are we wanting to do a full district wide? This is a district wide thing. District wide. I think yeah. I think as a board we should know what's happening in the district yeah. before we can do it. So I, I would say it's both. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Um, after that I wrote down, there's been so much discussion, I wrote down DLA and boundaries. But if anybody else feels like there's something that was more important that came up that we've talked about, Lisa, I student achievement. I would rather look at how we're doing right now academically in our schools, where are the grade? Where are the needs? Mm -hmm. What do they need, and how can we help? How do we I'd rather start there. Well, that is like our top. I know it's all tied in. Board goal, technically, yeah. right? Yeah. If I picked a place it, to jump in, it, it would be no. It, 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 yeah. Like you said, everything's tied in together because right. it's like, how can we do more support? Well, we also might be financially limited to be able right. to do some yeah. extra support, and we may have to look at decisions on different programs, and, and yeah. we don't know what those are, but it. These are going to be, they're all tied together. Right, okay. So I think, so, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there's a lot of value, though, in focusing on student achievement, 
finding some kind of a goal of what kind of metric is the best thing to focus on right now. Like for a while, it has been the graduation rates, right? And we've seen that rise. And what are we doing to support that? And so is it time for a new type of focus okay. or something like that? And then, yes, yeah, see how things fall to support that. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a goal right now. There's a board goal that every student on grade level every year, right? So for now, we have that goal. Like, let's look at how we're doing. Let's look at where we aren't hitting students at grade level, right? And, and then that might force the next task around boundaries or finances or, I mean, it, but I think if it's being driven by how does this support student achievement, which also will force conversations around our teachers not burning out and, and making sure they have the support they need. But so, so I mean. I'm not trying to just push for what I want, but that, there no, you go. No, but that's okay. But I have a, so I have a question for you. So I'm gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm not trying to push back necessarily, but no, I'm, no, I want to push back. you further. Okay. So I feel like visioning. That's easy for us to know. We're gonna go look for a consultant, and we're gonna start that process. But when you say focus on student achievement, that's so much more broad. So like, what, what, what do you, what do you want to like, what do you want us to study or look into, or does that make sense? Like, uh, what, what kind of well, Where I was just going to say, let's let's hear from our assistant superintendents yeah. on their ideas around this. Just one thought. Um, as I have gone through the strategic planning process times before with districts and schools, that whole process and conversation where you're starting with mission or aim, as our superintendent calls, then vision, then values, then goals, that process tends to surface many of these specifics that you're wanting to get to. Because you do, I mean, you're, you're starting with mission. What are we all about? Why, why do we function as an organization? And that can lead to the vision of, here's what we can make happen. Similar to what the board did with their goals about the graduation rates. There was a vision for that. Um, again, some of values and goals then tend to come through that process. So you might think about some of the student achievement issues coming, surfacing through the process of strategic planning, yeah. in my experience. I'll just make a maybe nudge, but I'll try to I'll make a, I'll make a quick comment as well that I, I, I do feel like Anne-Marie's suggesting there's like kind of ad hoc strategic planning happening right now. And, and a wise mentor told me early in my administrative career to, to make sure that I, I work within my lane. Sometimes there's a hesitancy for me to go and do someone else's job. When I was a young principal, sometimes if the, the lunchroom get, didn't get cleaned very well, I would, I'd go find a mop and I'd clean. And I thought, well, that's what a good principal would do. But then when I was doing that, I wasn't being a principal. And, and a wise mentor said, just make sure that you're doing the job that is your essential functions first, and then you can be helpful to others too. So. I think the board's role of governance is to really to govern and to get into the weeds about you know an, ex an exact boundary or a, a certain program or something that we're doing. Give us direction, and your professional staff will work in our lanes to get that stuff done. But we can't set the direction for the district; only this team can. Yeah. I'd like to add the the notion of the that aim statement. So Lisa just referenced it and Anne-Marie also, so I just want to remind everybody. It simply says that every student, the goal, the objective here is that every student will end each year on grade level. Now, if you think about the impact of what that would mean, that means that they're not behind when they start the next year. And as that accu does not accumulate over the years, that means they're all on track for graduation. I'll tell you what's the problem with that particular one. Well, there's two problems. One is we've never really fully embraced it. Number two, that's probably the loftiest goal I've ever seen in my life in public education. Because there are students who will unfortunately fall back. And so it really depends on the, the craft and the artistry of the teacher to be able to, and, and those of us who are providing the supports to be able to accomplish that for all of our kids. That's like setting a goal of saying we want to have 100% graduation. But on the other hand, don't we? So I really invite you to think about that one because as much as it's been on the books for a number of years, it's never really been operationalized. And there are a lot of elements to that. One of them is a consistent curriculum that's being taught throughout the district. 
based on the research that we do. So anyway, I'll be quiet, but those are just some ideas for you to think about. Going along with what Keith just said, um, Derek shared with us the Hattie effect stuff, and that could help us with our priorities as well, and it goes along with the curriculum. Um, if what's going to be most effective in change. And Hattie's done a lot of work on that to help us prioritize that. Anybody on the board who doesn't have a copy of Visible Learning, I have one for you, the book. And you will, you will get a lot of sleep when you read that. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can just jump in and piggyback off the superintendent's comment. Um, because I've had this this thought uh, rolling around in my head for quite some time I, in, in terms of goals. And if I get a little pedantic about this, that, that, excuse me for saying so. But I, uh, if you've come across the title uh, Atomic Habits, it's really popular right now. Uh, it really impacted me as I've thought about goals and, and being goal-driven throughout my life. Uh, there's a statement in there that says people, and I think or this applies to organizations as well, they don't rise or fall necessarily to their goals. They rise or fall to their systems or their habits. And so as we are thinking about what I would for, refer to as outcome goals, we need, to be, uh, to, we need to be thinking about those process goals and how we improve our systems. Otherwise, these goals are just the lofty aspirations that really don't lead to, I mean, we are not going to see tangible. It's really about system improvement. So it's set, set the goal by all means. That's what we. That's our north star as an organization. But then be really clear about what are the systems that we need to improve to help us get there. And I think maybe part of that is the curriculum piece that has been re referred to. It's a process driven and uh, we, what, what he's explaining is like perfect example is take, let's say we talk reading on grade level, right? Is that, let's say that's our vision or our goal, but what is the system or process that we use internally to make sure that every kid gets there? And that process, once it's streamlined, nailed down and everybody understands it and it's re re repeatable, that's what he's kind of referring to. So. And I feel like as a board, though, our job is to have like a unified vision and kind of direction and set of values, you know, and, and then your job is to maybe get the systems in place and for us to be a place that hears about how that's going and supports you with policy um, as, as you implement the system. You know what I mean? Like, but I, but I feel like... Yeah, I agree. We need to just come up with what our clear vision is and set of values are. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because then that's something that we can measure the systems that are being implemented to what our vision is, right? And then we can always say, okay, we're falling short. Let's collaborate and figure out where we can do better, which will also probably help a new, like when we do hire a new superintendent to have some guidance from us what we're expecting from them. I think we did, right, in that brochure. I yeah. feel like it communicated fairly clearly, right, what we're currently. Looking. Right, we are not goal yeah. lists or vision right. lists or any of that right now at all. Right. Uh, this isn't, and this isn't, uh, to, I mean, when I bring up visioning, I don't bring it up to say that we have no vision, because we have a vision, right? I just think, mm -hmm. I, I personally think about every 10-ish years is a good time to relook at everything. The things change so much. I mean, if... I mean, you guys can attest to this. That's the way we did school 10 years ago versus what we do right now even is incredibly different, right? Just, I mean, COVID launched us into, I mean, such a different way, right? So the point is, I think it's a good time to to, re, to take a good look at everything. I mean, from our, from, from our standpoint, which is the overall vision and the goals, right? So, so yeah, I, just, I guess I just wanted to be clear and make sure everybody here knows no one here is, Vision list. 
there's so much vision here. It's, it's just a good time to just maybe look at it again and refocus. Well, I think that's the problem we have. We are all so vision, so much vision, that yes. we have to figure out how we're going to align our visions right. and get processes in place. So I guess something that I don't know we need to do here, but it would be interesting as we've been talking, I would be interested to hear, probably not today, I love you all, but not today. Um, I'd love to hear what would it look like What would from us? Like, I've heard that maybe too specific of goals are maybe not helpful, and then too broad of goals are also not helpful. What would be helpful for you guys to have from us, right? And I, and, I, and I like Doug's comment, we need to basically stay in our lane, right? I don't always stay in my lane, you guys know that. Maybe <laughs> but I try. Maybe it's that we, can I, uh, you can answer too, but you're triggering a thought that I'd like to just say is, we set the vision of the goals and then we keep them accountable. Like we are the ones who follow up enough to make sure it's happening, right? I just want to make sure I, that what we're giving them is useful. Like if I just yeah. say, I want my kids to do well, then these guys are going to be like, I don't know what that means. So we have to be, I think we have to be specific enough, but also not too specific. And so I don't know, well, I've never been a, a, a superintendent. Consultant. I don't know what you need. I think a consultant will help, but some of the classes I've been to before where they've talked about doing things like this, like at USBA and stuff. So the way I've interpreted what I've heard and pictured this is it's not the seven of us doing this process. It is this whole room and going to like, you know, the papers on the wall and we get in small groups and talk about things and we also get input from other avenues, maybe principals weigh in on some things, right? Um, so it's a shared vision that maybe ultimately when, if we have to decide something, the board is like, okay, this is what we're doing, but it's, we've created it together because we are a team. I agree. I, I would second that. I would like to just, you know, add that I feel like that strategic planning process, you start with a certain group and, and at some point you may decide to add people, like you're adding principals, you're adding teachers, you're adding others to give their feedback. And as you do that, you, you do what Gina described, you build vision and, and different things, but you also then start to get into what is the function of how will we achieve those goals, how will we do those things. And so I think the, st the strategic planning process is the key to this, you know, getting that process going. And, you know, we're in an interesting space, looking for a new superintendent, that kind of a thing. And so I think once that's, that process is taken care of, then we could move into working together on the strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Well, and honestly, like, we're three months out from this new superintendent. I mean, there's not a lot we can get done even if we try before the new superintendent comes. I mean, I think the timeline to get it started really is now. And see, so the RFP process is gonna take us 60 days. Right. So. so I think that you were right, Rebecca, saying that's where we need to start. And then maybe in the meantime, if, as we need a guiding, we need a guiding star, we could fall back to, to what Lisa was saying, which is student achievement, because that's really what and school's about, support. student achievement and teacher support. And then we can, we can, I don't know what I was gonna say. I've been up since 3.40. Uh, mess with it, mess with it is not a good, I have a PhD, you wouldn't know it. <laughs> but you know, we can, massage it is also, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Keep going. Do you know what, maybe I, <laughs> sorry. I don't know if this is what you're trying to say. But I think we, yeah, we think about student achievement teacher support while we start this strategic planning. And the reality is the strategic plan, there's no way it's not gonna support those two things. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, right. Can I, so if, I don't know if anyone cares, but this is just the strategic planning timeline that the Canyon School District used, right? So for a couple, like from May to June, they did the analyze plan and align, right? And so this is just, I think your kind of prep, are we gonna use a consultant, right? So this could probably start, because then you do community engagement, the next, two months, and then the, then after that is the design, the refine and implement, and the design, the refine and implement seems very, this is where what you're saying is gonna come in, mm -hmm. and the superintendent, right? So, and I think the community engagement piece, Lisa, we've had, like you were saying, we've kind of started some of that, and we have some input already, and then we can decide, do we need more focus groups? I mean, the, obviously we don't need to do it the way they did it, but it is nice that there's this timeline that they used, so that maybe we should like move forward starting at the beginning of the process and then right now 
okay, how do we? We're do? not missing tasks to do in the meantime. No. So I feel not like this bored. is a good <laughs> decision <laughs> in terms of what we're doing, right? So because we have a lot of things in the next couple months. Absolutely. I mean, we already have plenty of things keeping us busy as everyone is. Everyone here yeah. needs. So. Right. Okay. So then if it's okay with everyone, I think what we'll try and do is, I think the next step is maybe do some RFPs for like consultant work and we'll start looking into that. And, maybe, and I assume it'll be something similar to the superintendent search where they come present to us and what they can do for us and then we'll decide from there, right? Right. Okay. Does that sound like a good... Sorry. Make? Go ahead. I mean, are we interested? I mean, I could talk, we could reach out to Canyon School District, I know, and just ask there, about their process. I used their group guide. has already contacted us okay. about, so you guys are do you want to yeah. use us too? So, yeah, and but I, we did I, have to go through the process. I think even Canyons would probably say definitely go with this direction. Keith and I will get together and we'll come up yeah. with a list right, of they would people say. that send out RFPs. Okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see what the document you have. <laughs> Okay, so that sounds like the next step is to send out some RFPs and get started on this. Okay, and I think I think I agree that a lot of the things on this list will naturally come up as we as we go through our visioning process. And can I can I just say I, I appreciate the process that, that that you went through to do this. Like even though we may not be, you know, following it exactly, I, I appreciated being asked. I appreciate that you were willing to give me your feedback because I don't know what I'm doing, so I, I need everyone else to help me, so thank you. I don't think any of us do. Well, don't I, tell I, the voters. I think we'll get to so many of these tasks, but we'll do it in the context of what it's meant to serve and support rather than just starting in on a bunch of things that seem important. So I, I think it's thank you so much for thank you guys. conversation. Okay, that was a good, good little conversation. I appreciate that from everyone. All right, that's it. Um, so, unless anyone else wants to say some more, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, we're adjourned. Melanie, you didn't even No, I was ready to jump on that. Before someone has to Actually, technically, you're not allowed to say anything more. <laughs>